Hello everyone, I am Dr. Prashant and in this presentation we will talk about the causes, diagnosis and management of hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia occurs in 10% of hospitalized patients, carries a 1% mortality and is a medical emergency requiring emergent care. It is defined as a serum potassium of more than 5.5 milliequivalents per liter. The etiology of hyperkalemia may be classified into pseudo-hyperkalemia, intra to extracellular shifts and inadequate excretion. Pseudo-hyperkalemia may occur because of hyperosmolality and beta-adrenergic antagonists. Intra to extracellular shifts occurs when potassium from within the cell shifts outside thereby increasing the potassium in the serum. This may occur because of acidosis, hyperosmolality, which may occur because of radio contrast agents, hypertonic saline, dextrose. It may also occur because of beta adrenergic antagonists, specifically the non-cardioselective agents, digoxin and related glycosides such as yellow oleander and foxglove, and hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. Intra to extracellular shift may also occur because of positively charged amino acids such as lysine, arginine and amino caproic acid, succinylcholine, cumylysis. Inadequate excretion may occur because of renin-angiotensin system inhibition, decreased distal delivery, hyporeninemic hypoaldosteronism and renal resistance to mineralocorticoids. RAS inhibition may occur because of ACE inhibitors, renin inhibitors such as aliskirin and angiotensin receptor blockers. It may also occur because of mineralocorticoid receptor blockers such as spironolactone and eplerinone and blockade of epithelial sodium channel agents such as amyloride and trimethoprim may also cause hyperkalemia. Decreased distal delivery may occur because of congestive heart failure and volume depletion. Hyporeninemic hypoaldosteronism may occur because of tubulointerstitial disease such as in systemic lupus erythematosus and sickle cell anemia. It may also occur in diabetes and because of drugs such as NSAIDs and COX-2 inhibitors. It may also occur because of pseudo-hypoaldosteronism type 2 which is due to a defect in the WNK1 and 4 kinases. Inadequate excretion of potassium may occur due to primary adrenal insufficiency or due to advanced renal disease. Primary adrenal insufficiency may occur because of autoimmune conditions such as Addison's disease or polyglandular syndromes, infections such as HIV and CMV, infiltrative disorders such as amyloidosis, malignancy and metastasis and because of drugs such as heparin. Adrenal hemorrhage or infarction may also cause primary adrenal insufficiency resulting in hyperkalemia. Advanced renal insufficiency as seen in chronic kidney disease and oliguric acute kidney injury may also cause hyperkalemia. The clinical spectrum of hyperkalemia ranges from sinus bradycardia to ventricular tachycardia. There can also be sinus arrest and ventricular fibrillation and slow idioventricular rhythms resulting in asystole may also be seen. The ECG changes in hyperkalemia are important and here we see a normal ECG trace for comparison with the abnormal traces. The first abnormality in hyperkalemia may be tall pointed T waves. There can also be a progressive loss of P wave as seen in the ECG below. There could also be widening of the QRS complex. And finally, there could be the sine wave pattern. The diagnostic approach to hyperkalemia involves assessing if the potassium is more than 6 or the patient is having ECG changes. In such cases, emergency therapy is required. If pseudo-hyperkalemia is suspected, then no treatment is required. A thorough history and physical examination would go a long way in identifying the cause of hyperkalemia. If there is evidence of increased potassium load, this can be treated accordingly. Similarly, if there is evidence of transcellular shift, this can be treated accordingly as well. If decreased urinary potassium excretion is suspected, then urine electrolytes may be the way to go. If urine sodium is less than 25, then this indicates a decreased distal delivery of sodium. If not, we must go for the transtubular potassium gradient or TTKG. If the TTKG is more than 8, this indicates a reduced tubular flow as may be seen in advanced kidney disease or reduced extracellular volume. If it is less than 5, then this is due to reduced distal potassium secretion and in such cases the patient will benefit with a trial of fludrocortisone. Once fludrocortisone is administered, if the patient 
still has a low TTKG in that there is tubular resistance, then this indicates a reduced tubular flow. And this may be because of drugs such as amyloride, spironolactone and triamterene, or maybe because of tubulo interstitial disease, urinary tract obstruction or systemic lupus erythematosus. If on administration of fludrocortisone, the TTKG resolves to more than 8, this indicates a low aldosterone and in such cases, serum renin levels may be useful. A high serum renin level may indicate primary adrenaline insufficiency, heparin use or ACE inhibition. A low serum renin level could indicate diabetes mellitus, acute glomerulonephritis or the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Treatment of hyperkalemia must be considered when there are electrocardiographic changes due to hyperkalemia or the serum potassium is more than 6 to 6.5 without ECG changes. Both these conditions are medical emergencies and require urgent treatment. The treatment of hyperkalemia is aimed at the immediate antagonism of cardiac effects of hyperkalemia, rapid reduction of plasma potassium by redistribution into cells and removal of potassium. Immediate antagonism of the cardiac effects of hyperkalemia is done with calcium gluconate. It serves to raise the action potential threshold and reduce excitability without changing the resting membrane potential. 10 ml of 10% calcium gluconate over 2-3 to three minutes with cardiac monitoring is the treatment of choice. In patients who are on digoxin, 10 ml of 10% calcium gluconate in 100 ml dextrose over 30 minutes is preferred. Rapid reduction of plasma potassium by redistribution into cells may be accomplished by insulin 10 units regular intravenous with 50 ml of 50% dextrose. This may also be accomplished with 10 to 20 mg of albuterol in 4 ml of normal saline. Salbutamol may also be used. Here we have a caveat, sodium bicarbonate has no role in acute management and may be given as an infusion for delayed effect. Removal of potassium can be accomplished with cation exchange resins, diuretics and dialysis. Dialysis is the most effective and reliable technique to reduce serum potassium. The resins that we mentioned earlier may be sodium polystyrone sulfonate and newer binding agents. The newer binding agents are patiromer and ZS9 and they bind potassium in exchange for calcium and have the potential to revolutionize the management of hyperkalemia. That's it for our presentation on hyperkalemia. Thanks for watching and we will see you in the next video.